Praise the Lord. We're glad you're here. Amen. We're glad to see you. Glad you're still living with us and here worshiping the Lord with us. And open your Bible to Revelation 21. What's all that noise about? (laughs) Revelation 21. Oh, there's my little controller. Does this cut down if I hit it again? Hold on. Uh, It's just got one speed. Okay. There are four buttons on here below this little controller they fixed up for me. And you may not know what this is, but they are scattered throughout the auditorium. And if I see you going to sleep, I will push one. And, and you might get a little jolt under your seat. Aren't you glad to be alive? Aren't you glad to be saved and know you're going to heaven and just excited about the Lord Jesus? Let's stand together and look with me at verse 4. And I love this verse right here. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death. Hallelujah. No sorrow, no crying. There shall be no more pain. For the former things are passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, talking to John, Write with a comma, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who is thirsty. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. Do you know as a saved person we are an overcomer? And I will be his God and he shall be my son. And I'm going to leave verse 8 for just in a few minutes. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you, Lord, we can come together one more time. We can lift up your holy name. And Father, I, I ask you to meet with us in a special way today. I pray, dear God, that you'll touch every heart and leave no one out. And, Father, there may be someone here that needs to be saved. And I pray they'll even come right now and give their life to you. Father, I pray that uh, for those who are out of fellowship, we as Christians, we get out of fellowship, I pray, God, that we will make a fresh commitment of our life today. We do pray for our country. We pray for our president. We pray for all those in government. And Father, I pray in your holy name you'll bring them down on their face, that they might call out upon you and they might seek you for all guidance because we know you're the only truth. You're the only way out of the mess that we're in. So Father, we glorify you. We thank you, God, for the air that we breathe. We thank you, Lord, for uh, just being alive right now. And Father, I want to pray a special prayer for... Uh, Brenda Lloyd's granddaughter. I don't know what's going on right now, but I know she's in Florida. And I know she's critical, very critical. And Lord, I ask you to heal that little baby, nine years old. Father, I pray that you'll touch her heart in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible clearly specifies two paths. It clearly tells us about two types of people, and it clearly tells us about two places each one of us will spend eternity. In the end, the Bible tells us, excuse me, in the end, the Bible tells us that the saved will go to heaven and the lost will go to hell. As I'm speaking right now, I pray that you are a born-again believer. I pray that you have been to the cross and you have experienced the blood of Jesus and you know Him through repentance and faith. And if you don't know that, my friend, I want to tell you this morning, you're in big trouble. You are in the trouble of the prince and power of the air, whom we call Satan himself. As sure as I'm standing here this morning, there is a heaven, but also there is a hell. 
The title of the message as we continue our series of messages, on this I know, here's the title. There is a real hell. For the last two Sundays, we've talked about heaven, and I've enjoyed talking about that. But this morning, it is a very, very difficult subject. It is a subject that I really do not like to talk about. In other words, this is not a happy message like we've talked about the last two Sundays on heaven. The same Bible that tells us about the hallelujahs of heaven also tells us about the horrors of hell. I looked at the life of the Lord Jesus and He talked more about about hell than He did about heaven. In fact, He talked about hell 53 times. He preached on hell during his first sermon. He preached on hell at his last sermon. A poll was conducted several years ago by USA Today. Come to find out that 67% of Americans believe there is a place called hell, but only 25% of them believes they're on their way to that place. There may be some of you listening to me this morning in the church house. You may be listening by live stream, and you are not sure in your mind if there's a hell. Some people think today it is a state of mind. I've heard remarks like this over the years, and I'm sure you have too. Why, a good God would never send anybody to hell. Have you ever heard that? I've heard that several times. I will not go to hell, preacher, because I'm really not that bad of a person. Hell is a concept of brainwashing, some people say. Hell is is a metaphor in the Bible, they say. And some people even think that we're in hell now. There's some people who believe that they are in hell right now. Now, I don't know about you, but I've been invited to go to hell. (laughs) And before I was saved, I told a lot of people to go to hell. But I want you to know that this is a subject that should not be taken lightly. It is a subject that is so serious. My friend, you are one heartbeat away from either heaven or hell. There are four different terms used in the Bible for the word hell. And I want to give them to you very quickly before we get into the message. The first one is Sheol, S-H-E-O-L. This term is used 65 times in the Old Testament. And it has the meaning of the hell, the grave, death, destruction, and also the word, the pit. It is depicted as the general abode of the dead. A place where life no longer exists. Let me read something to you out of the Old Testament in Psalms 49. Chapter 49, verses 13 and 14. The Bible says, Like sheep they are laid in the grave. Death shall feed on them. The upright shall have dominion over them in the morning, and their beauty shall be consumed in the grave far from their dwelling. Wow. Second word is the word Hades, H-A-D-E-S. This is the Greek word for hell that we find in the New Testament. It is depicted as a prison with gates, a prison with bars, and a prison with locks. Its location is downward, and it is used 11 times in the Bible. One commentary said this, This word is associated with Orcus, the infernal regions, a dark and dismal place in the very depths of the earth. The receptacle of disembodied spirits, the abode of the wicked. <clears throat> Matthew 11, Capernaum, you are exalted to heaven, but you will be brought down to hell. Luke 16, 23, and in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. 1 Corinthians 15, 55, <clears throat> O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? That is the second word in the Bible used for hell. The third word is Gehenna, G-E-H-E-N-A. This word is used 11 times in the New Testament by the Lord Jesus Himself. It is a reference to the Valley of Hinnom, 
a geographical place outside the city of Jerusalem in Israel. Now, in ancient times, the valley called Hinnom, the pagans worshipped their god, Molech, if I pronounce that god name, god's name right. He was a fire god whose belly was filled with fire and his arms were outstretched. And the pagans during that time, what they would do is they would give an offering to that god and they would put their little children, their little babies inside the arms of where the fire was. You can imagine the cries out of the mothers. How warped to be able to believe something like that. Later on, Jesus, in his time, the Valley of Hinnom became the garbage dump for the city of Jerusalem, and we probably know that. This garbage dump, listen, the burning never went out. It burned continually. Dead bodies of criminals were cast there. Not a bad idea. It was a place that smelled of rotting flesh, and the stench around that area was almost, almost unbearable. The worms would continually eat of the garbage. Jesus said it's a place where the fire is never quenched. Matthew 5, verses 22, 29, and 30. Chapter 10, verse 28. Chapter 12, verse 5. There's one more word that is used only one time in the New Testament. It is the word Tartarus. It's spelled T-A-R-T-A-R-U-S. This word emphasizes eternal punishment, and it is used in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4. So you have four different words that are used for that one word, hell. You know, when I think about it this morning, hell is hell. It doesn't matter what you call it. People want to explain it away. They want to ignore it. They want to say it does not exist, and they want to shut it out of their mind. You can say those things, my friend, but that does not do away with the existence of hell. Hell is a reality, and preachers need to preach on this subject. I believe the reason we have so much hell in our world is because we do not have much in our pulpits. If we had more preaching on hell in the pulpits, we might have less living like hell in the pews. We don't have pews, preacher. Well, I know that. William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, said something great. He said to all those preacher boys who came to him for training about soul winners, he said, young men, if I had my way, I would not put you through Bible college. What I would do is put you in hell for five minutes and experience there the pain and the torment and the horror and the suffering in that place. And then you would go out through the world, through the nation. And you would be preaching to people to not go to that place. That was a good statement. This morning, we at Hickory With, we need to sound the alarm. Churches across Fayette County and Tennessee and across our nation and world, listen friend, we need to sound the alarm. We need to get motivated to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul said, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, women, and young people. Some of you today who are listening to this message, you have loved ones and friends who are going to die. Listen, they're going to die and go to hell unless you tell them the good news of the gospel. The best thing you can do today is to be the example. That's good. We walk our daily walk. We go to the places that we go. We need to be the example. We need to set the example before all the people that we care about and come in contact with. But friend, we can't stop right there. God has given you and me a mouth and we better share. Well, let me say that kinder. We need to share the gospel with them. Can you imagine being in 
heaven and your husband not being there, by the way, you won't know that. But can you imagine? Can you imagine your best friend being in hell and you being in heaven? You will have one of three reactions to this message this morning. Number one, you will reject it. Number two, you will ignore it. Number three, you will accept it and then do something about it. Again, I want to tell you this is a very, very serious matter. There are three points to the message. And I've been studying on this message for a long time, and, and I got through with the first point, and that's all I could cover this morning. So we'll have the other two next Sunday. It's a lot, y'all. Here's the first point, and the only point this morning. What does the Bible say about hell? And it has several sub-points under that. What does the Word of God say about this place called hell? Well, first of all, hell is going to be a place of vile associations. Look at verse 8 with me in our text in Revelation 21. Now listen to this group. But the cowardly and the unbelieving, the abominable, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Have you ever heard anybody say, if I go to hell, I will have a whole lot of company? This is the company right there you're going to be with. Chapter 20 and verse number 10. One, one chapter back. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and forever. Let me ask you a question. Where is Satan right now? Listen, Satan is not in hell right now. He is the prince and the power of the air. But one day, hallelujah, he will be cast into the abyss. One day he will be cast into hell. The word forever in that verse right there, in the Greek is the same word to describe the duration of heaven. Friend, when I get to heaven, I'm going to have a wonderful time because I'm going to be with Jesus. Well, don't get too excited. And I'm going to be there with, with all my loved ones and friends and everybody, and I'm going to know everybody, and it's going to be wonderful. It's going to be forever. But my friend, when a person goes to hell, the same Greek word is used, and it is hell forever and forever. It is a word that means a constant, endless existence. You may have forgotten this, but all of us in this room, everybody in the world is going to live forever. We're going to live forever. There is no reincarnation, no matter what anybody says. We're going to live forever in heaven or hell. Not only that, the Bible tells us that angels, fallen angels, will be in hell. And that's according to 2 Peter chapter 2 and 4. The de- Listen, the demons who followed the devil, Satan, when he got out of heaven, they're going to be there. They are the ones that said... I want to be like the Most High God. One day the Bible says they'll be cast into the lake of fire. And by the way, I want to pause for a moment and tell you that demon possession is real. That's good. It's real. A person can be possessed by demons. And please don't miss it. A Christian can never be possessed by demons. Many people today who peddle pornography are possessed by demons. Do you know that? Those that are involved in human trafficking. I want to read something to you I wrote down this morning. When people think of human trafficking, they think of people being kidnapped and held in cages. And by the way, that is true and that is real. There are some children, there are some teenagers, some adults that are, what's the word I'm looking for? They are not snatched away. Yes. But listen to this. 
It also encompasses sex trafficking and forced labor. The selling of small children and teenagers for sex. These are boys and girls, and this is what I found out. The highest percentage of female victims are between 9 and 20 years of old, and they are used when they're snatched away. They're used for somebody to come and buy them for sexual pleasure. I want to ask you something. Have you ever seen someone tied up by their ankles? And their hands tied behind their back? Have you ever seen anybody put on a rope like that and you swing them back and forth and back and forth? And have you ever seen the strike zone where a guy comes across right there with a bat? I'm going to get in the flesh and say that's what ought to happen to every one of them. Friend, that may be ugly, but it's time that, it's time that we, we take a stand for what is right. Can you imagine your child being taken from you and you cannot find them and they're being used for something like that? I believe that those that do the abortions, they could be possessed by demons. Remember Hitler? You've read about him. Stalin? Remember Charles Manson? I believe they were all possessed by demons. Well, secondly, this morning, hell is a place for the unbelieving. A person who never gives their life to Jesus. There's going to be a lot of church members there. They're going to say, look, I've got my Sunday school pen. I've got my perfect attendance where I am thought I was going to heaven, but I'm not. Friend, there's going to be a lot of church people there. A lot of Baptists because they never gave their life to Jesus. Do you know what the greatest sin is? Think about it. What is the greatest sin that you can think of? The greatest sin that we can ever think of is the sin of unbelief. People, would t- people have told me, well, preacher, I'd like to come to the church and I'd like to believe in God, but, you know, I can't come because there's so many hypocrites there. I mean, what a dumb statement to make. Amen. I would rather be in a church where there are a few hypocrites and I'm on my way to heaven than to be in hell with all of them. See, hell is not a place where there's a big party going on. The alcoholic will be there with their sin nature. Isn't that sad? The drug addict will be there with his drug addiction. The sex pervert will be there with their perversion to hell unless they receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Thirdly, and this is sad, hell is a place of separation. Look at chapter 21, verse 27. But there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Friend, that's so good to know. When you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, your name is written in the Lamb's book of life, and nobody can ever take it away, and nobody can ever erase it, and you can never lose it once you have it. Luke 13, 28, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you shall see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrust out. You know who he was talking to here? He was talking to some church members, some Pharisees that were not saved. Don't look at your watch, Dave. I see all. <laughs> A person in hell will be separated from God. A person in hell will be separated from all those loved ones, all the loved ones who went to heaven, but they didn't. A person in hell will be separated from all your, listen, all your friends if you go to hell and they go to heaven. You will weep and wail and gnash your teeth. Hell is hell because there's separation from God. I can't think of any other terrible thing that it can be. Separated, knowing there's no escape. Knowing there's no hope. 
knowing it will never change, knowing you can never get out. I want to ask you, listen, I've never, I've never understood how can a person be in a church service and walk out on God and don't look back and taking the risk of a car accident. Taking the risk of dying of a heart attack. Taking the risk of, oh my goodness, of Jesus coming again. I got a call from Brenda Lloyd. I mentioned her a while ago in our prayers. The granddaughter's name is Ruby, is it not? Ruby? Ruby's nine years old and she has a very rare disease, but she's still nine years old. They live in Florida. Heather, the daughter, used to be a member of this church right here. Got a call, I believe it was Friday, Friday evening. Anyway, it was either Friday or Saturday, and the little girl had fallen out again. She had, she had passed out, and on the way to the hospital, her heart stopped beating. And she went into intensive care, and they put her on a ventilator, and now there's no brain activity in her head. My friend, listen. I've talked to some people in this church on Sunday. And I didn't see them next Sunday because they were in the ground. I'm not trying to scare anybody. I'm just telling you the facts of this life that we live in. We think we're going to live a long time and we're going to enjoy all this stuff all for a long time. But friend, we're not. Life is like a what? It's like a vapor. Young man who was lost was going out for a night of sin. He made his way over to the door, and on the way to the door, there was a little table there, and, it, and he saw a gospel track on the table. His mother had been talking to him and witnessing to him. That young man who was very angry, he picked up that gospel track, and he crumbled it up, and he threw it on the floor. He went over to his mother. He said, Mama, why do you keep on bugging me about this? He, she, he said, I was on the bus today and another person gave me a track. But I did not look at it. The mama began to cry. The tears were coming down her, down her face and her, her chin was shivering. She said, son, nobody is going to witness to you in hell. Friend, if you're going to be a witness to, you're going to be a witness to now. If you are going to be saved, you're going to be saved now while you're on this earth. Do not ever believe that somebody can be baptized for you once they're gone. You cannot do that. The Bible says the devil and his angels will be there and all unbelievers. It's a place of separation. Number four. Hell is a place of darkness. Stay with me now. Chapter 8, verse 12. The children in the kingdom will be cast into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You know what? It almost sounds like outer space. The fire will, listen, the fire will burn, but it sheds no light. You will not be able to see your hand right in front of your face. And Jude 13 calls it the blackness of darkness forever. No stars, no sun, no moon, no light. The Bible calls it outer darkness. I remember the reading, the true story of the 14-year-old boy who was raised in an ungodly home. He was very sick, and he knew he didn't have much time to live. He was about to die. His daddy was also an unbeliever. One thing about the young boy he had talked to his parents about, he said, I am very afraid of getting, in, a, getting in, a, in the ground and having dirt thrown on top of me. He said, Daddy, I want you to promise me one thing. When I leave this world and I die, I want you to make some way where there will be a window down over my casket and a window up near the ground there where the sunlight can come in. The young boy did die. And the father built a shaft going down to the coffin with a, a window on the top. One on top of the casket, cut it out, and one at the top or the ground so the sun could come in. Friend, if you die without Jesus Christ, the light will not come through the window. Number five, hell is a place of hopelessness. Somebody said hopelessness is one of the saddest words in the English language. 
I mean, as long as you have life, there is hope. If you were to go in the hospital and the doctor told you and told your family that you're not going to live very long, but, but you even heard that you were still alive and you were there with them, there's always hope. As long as you have enough energy in your body, you may lose a job, you may get a divorce, your children may run away from home, you may have all kinds of terrible things, but my friend, listen, as long as you have breath, you have hope. But if you die and go to hell, there is no hope. There's no hope of heaven, and there's no hope of salvation. Some people think that they have the idea that they're going to be in hell a hundred years, and if you thought that, you might still have a little hope. Listen to Revelation 14. And the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. Think for a moment how sad it would be to be in hell. And say there will never be a way out. Proverbs 11, when a wicked man dies, his expectation will perish, and the hope of unjust men perishes. You know what that means? That means if you die, when you die, there is no hope, because hope stays here, and hope leaves you. A submarine sank off the coast of the North Atlantic, and they went down and tried to raise the submarine on the inside, the submarine, the men on the inside, they were pecking out the message in Morse code. Is there any hope? Is there any hope? One last thing. Hell is a place of fire and burning. Revelation 20 and 14, and, the, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. Chapter 21, verse 8. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexual immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. I don't know what kind of fire it's going to be, my friend. But it is a fire that burns and burns and burns. And yet a person is not consumed. True story. A young man was working at a chemical plant in Cleveland, Ohio. They discovered a certain chemical, and it was amazing. You could get a glass of water, and you could take the little dropper, and you could put one drop into the water, and in just a few moments, it would disintegrate the water. A young man decided he's going to steal a tube of that and put it in his drawer at home. Later on, he had a party, and he was going to try to impress all of his friends that was there. He got a glass of water, and he got that chemical out, and he got a dropper, and he put one drop of that chemical inside that, that glass of water, and all of a sudden, the water disappeared. Well, he wanted to really impress them, so he, he got a large water basin, or sink basin. He ran it full of water and he went over to get that chemical. And the, the basin of water was on the floor. And while he was on the way over, he tripped for some reason. That chemical fell into the water. And the upper part of his body fell into the water. Immediately, he began to scream. Immediately, he began to say, I'm on fire. Can somebody please help me? They called the paramedics, and the paramedics came, took him on to the hospital, uh, reacting to his skin. There was a nurse there. She took a sponge. When the moisture would touch his skin, flames would literally leap off of his skin, off the pores all the time he was crying, I'm on fire. I'm on fire. I feel like I'm in hell. I'm on fire. And nobody could help him. And one hour later, my friend, death knocked on his door. And he was gone. Jesus said, hell is a place where the fire 
is never quenched. Hey, friend, please do not miss heaven. Do not this morning go to hell. If you go to hell, you know what you'll do? You'll have to walk over the blood of Jesus. If you go to hell this morning, you'll have to walk over the love of God. You'll have to walk over all the loved ones that's been praying for you and wanting you to be saved. And you'll have to walk over your friends. and You'll have to walk over this gospel message this morning and all the messages you've ever heard. Whatever it is that may be holding you back... You need to let go of it this morning and come to Jesus. If you get anything in life right, it better be eternity. The Bible says there is but a step between me and death. Well, preacher, how do I get saved? Romans chapter 10. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus... And believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. You will be saved. Preacher, can I really be saved? I stake my eternity on it. I believe this book right here. And I believe if you'll come like a little child, God will save you. You may have questions this morning and say, Brother Eddie, I don't know really if I've been saved or not. I remember when I went to church a long time ago. And I remember I made a decision, but I don't really know. He wants you to come today and nail it down once and for all. Don't worry about whether or not you're going to heaven. Because you do not have to go there. Some need to come in and get that assurance to nail that thing down. Some of you need to come and join our church. Do we need to come to the altar and pray? Sure we do. We've needed... We need prayer right now more for ourselves in this country than we ever have. God wants you to make a decision. It doesn't matter who you are. He wants you to make a decision this morning. I'm going to invite you to stand with me, please. If you bow your head and close your eyes. Heavenly Father, I know that hell is real. I know, dear God, that there may be some under the sound of my voice right now. They're on their way there. And I pray, God, you'll turn them around. Let them call out on you through repentance and faith and be saved. Father, I pray for the convicting power of the Holy Spirit to move in this auditorium, to move through this live stream. And I pray, God, you'll touch every person Oh, God, there's so much work to be done because so many people are going to hell. Help us to be like you. Amen and amen.